Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Apart Poetry Reading, a featured live event in the Southeast Asia Queer Cultural Festival 2021. My name is Rodrigo de la Pena Jr. and I'm the editor of Apart, an anthology of queer Southeast Asian poetry in the pandemic. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and express our solidarity with the people of Myanmar. We support their struggle to restore democracy as well as their rights to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. We call on our queer friends and allies all over Southeast Asia to join hands with the people of Myanmar. We mourn for the loss of brave souls who were murdered by the terrorist Myanmar junta. May their courage be contagious, rest in power. We are part of Southeast Asia and so we stand united with the poets, activists, and human rights defenders in Myanmar. I'd like to circle around this idea of being apart and apart. Apart is the title of our anthology, meant to reflect how we have been separated from one another during the pandemic because of lockdown, social distancing, and community quarantine. It's also a play on words how each of us is part of a bigger picture and that we are interconnected in one way or another. Thinking about the crisis in Burma, I can imagine how this sense of being apart and apart becomes more urgent and relevant. It's only fitting then that we dedicate our reading of poems today to our queer blinks in Myanmar. We have a wonderful lineup of poets today who will be reading their works from the anthology. We invite viewers to type comments um, and questions in the comment section. Um, if you haven't downloaded the anthology, please go ahead and go to the festival website to download the PDF file. And now I'd like to welcome our first reader for today. Nerissa del Carmen Guevara is a poet and performance artist residing in the Philippines. Author of Reaching Destination, published in 2004, her poetry is found in the Comstock Review and other publications. She was recently anthologized in The Achieve of the Mastery, Filipino poetry and verse from English, mid 1990s to 2016. So here's Nerissa. Hello, Rodrigo. Hello, everyone. A wall of wind from across the globe. How does it begin? The origin of doom. Butterfly wing gathered from a stream. Fin of careless fish. God. A typhoon is churning out there. 
today is stunning with its long sunlight lashes. Grief feels like this all the time. Typhoon in a distance, this city in perfect summer. What is destruction? There, there. Out there, something is happening, sailing over the wind. The quiet has a shimmer. The open sea is a gateway between heaven and earth. What did the beach look like when love ended? Were the plates still on the table? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nerisa, for that wonderful reading. I do have a question, which will also be my question to all the readers today. I'm taking this event as an opportunity for us to discover queer literatures in the region or works by queer Southeast Asian writers in any genre. So Nerisa, what book would you recommend? Um, I would recommend a book by a Filipino critic who's also a poet, J. Neil Garcia. The particular book I'm holding right now is Aura. And Aura is the gay theme in Philippine fiction in English. Why, why am I recommending this book? Because I like the way that it intervenes in a heteronormative space and uses a lens uh, to look at a really iconic work and to see the gay theme in it. That's great, thank you. Uh, so that's Aura by Jane Neal Garcia. Thank you again, Narisa. And uh, we'll move on to our next reader. Um, okay. Um, Stephanie Dogfoot is a poet drag performer and comedian from Singapore who can be found at at Steph Dogfoot on most of the social medias. Their first poetry collection, Roadkill for Beginners, was published by Math Paper Press. So here's Steph. In Singapore for since 2015 and this is the took up maybe yeah performing uh, five times for like yeah, but two to two to sometimes five times a week, and um, being under lockdown has sort of like yeah stopped me from performing for a very long time. And uh, the strange thing is that I miss it less than I thought. Um, so this poem goes out to um, I guess the comedian first the comedian who beat me in a roast battle for saying I look like a man, um, which is funny, but not for the reason that he thought. And uh, the comedian who got paid a whole bunch of money to go on a hour long rant about trans people, but it's also for all the uh, queer people who are able to be themselves um, in isolation. Okay, so it's called This Joke I Tell. The joke I tell people is that this is the longest I've gone without hearing a rape joke in years. The punchline being, I'm speaking this into my computer, webcam at a Zoom stand-up open mic. The premise being, I never thought I'd survive this long without a stage to perform on. The punchline being, it's actually kind of liberating, not caring what a room full of cishet strangers thinks of you anymore. The setup being, what if 2020 was the most gender euphoria I felt in my life? 
The punchline being, they can't misgender you if you don't go outside in the first place. The twist being, it's pretty cool to be able to pass finally. Something about computer screens and casually emailed off bios that makes us all braver. And they can't make you come out if you're not allowed outside in the first place. By which I mean, I've lost track of how many times I've started calling myself they. The premise being, I went five months without alcohol and didn't notice. The punchline being, I just really miss drinking too many beers and talking shit with dumb cishet male comedians sometimes. The setup being, months before the bars opened, he will ask if it's true that I'm, you know, uh, non-binary and okay, yes, the right pronouns aren't that important to you, right? The punchline being, but how does that work anyway? And the joke is, I never came out because it was hard enough explaining what bisexual meant. That this is the longest I've gone without explaining myself. The premise being, what does anyone have to prove to anyone in a pandemic? The premise being, what does anyone... Wait, uh, what was I supposed to prove in the first place? The punchline being, I'm still accumulating Hawaiian shirts, even as my chances to wear them keep falling. Call it preparing. And that's been my piece. Thank you so much for putting this together, Rodrigo. Thank, thank you. I really enjoyed the, that, that poem. Um, and it was one of the, I guess, few humorous pieces um, <laughs> about the pandemic that I've read. Okay. Um, but yeah, thinking about the, the like the question I posed to Nerissa earlier, like what um, queer book by a, by a Southeast Asian writer would you recommend? Um, I think the first that comes to mind is um, Ng Yi Sheng's Lion City. And uh, it's just a really interesting book of like really weird short stories. Yeah, yeah. Yixing's also a contributor in the anthology. He's yeah. not with us today, but yes, go ahead and um, we recommend um, Ng Yixing's Lion City. Thank you so much, Steph. Yeah, thank you. Our next reader is from, Viet uh, from Vietnam. Um, so Nguyen, Nguyen Vu Viet An is a Vietnamese young spirit, self-identified as queer. They are also the director of Curator in the CQCF 2021 lineup. So here's Viet An. Hi, I'm Viet An from Hung An, Vietnam. And today I will read my poem. A lot of the theme has to deal with reborning and rejuvenation. And here I will present Bad by Nguyen Vu Viet Anh. By the way, words are empty. Our love beats my heart to death. Is that a word? Yeah, no, duh. Home after bride, lying. The truth is, the world doesn't need Vietnam. Ped in Vietnamese means queer. Without queer, Vietnam is impeded. Ghosting, the voice is as 1 12 a.m. GMT. Plus. But in my neo frontal cortex, should have more queer more women, more people. Little by little, still drinking the rush of all, just in sparkle. And by the way, poets are empty. I guess that is life's joke that my father used to bait the shit out of my mother. And I cry and I said to myself, Forgive him? I would never. So at that time, a fake suicide was set up. My mother hid near the river. The script was set. Should I hide too? Chumbo, Mosset Blim. Oriban fish, abhorrent, the plastic clinging, 
put to rest riverbed and rain warm road steaming my veins beating pomegranate red spark the pity crawls out of the stream winds blowing skin hardened I hope you can resonate with the words that I wrote. The next topic, one of my favorite books from Vietnamese queer is Bong Shadow, an autobiography of a gay man. It talks about the struggle of reborning your identity rejuvenating your identity and the struggle of a queer man in Hanoi struggling with sex, love, identity and most important of all, family values The book really resonates with me because after all, family is one of my the focal point of my struggles. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Viet An, and for your recommendation. Um, our next reader, okay, is Steno. Okay, so Steno Padilla um, is a gay writer from Bulacan, Philippines. He won the Lampara Prize twice for his young adult novels in 2017 and 2018. His poems can be read in Busilak, New LGBTQ Poetry from the Philippines, and Short Story in the Ex Machina, Philippine Literature in the Time of COVID-19. So here's Teno. In Filipino and then in English. So here it goes. Sa dating tagpuan, sa umpisa kasi, 40 lang ang usapan. Pagkatapos ng higit sang buwan, balik na ulit sa dati. Makikita tayo ng alas 11 sa walang kamatayang tagpuan. Mananghalian, magkukwentuhan, magrereklamo tungkol sa kanikaniyang amo, at lalakad sa liwasan kahit tirik na tirik ang araw. Ngunit ang 40 ay naging 80, naging 1.50. Namuti na ang mata, nakapiit pa rin sa haula. Ang araw-araw na pagkikita na uwi sa tatlong letra, LED o LCD, at kung magkakatampuhan, idinadaan sa text. Salatman sa hawak, sa akbay at sa yakap, ang ating pakonsuelo, Narito pa tayo. Kung malasin man at hindi magtagpo sa sangbuan, magbaba ka sakali sa walang hanggang bukas. Batid natin kasi sa simula-simula pa lamang na hindi sa daplisan ng ating mga titi na susuka ang pagsasamang sinusubok ng salot, lipunan man o karamdaman. May higit na unawaan ang puso at isip na kahit ilang enta ang lumipas, tayo'y babalik at muli magtatagpo sa dati nating tagpuan. A meeting place. Well, at first, we thought it was 40. But more than a month later, all will return to normal. We'll meet at 11 in our usual meeting place. We'll have our lunch chatter, complain about our bosses, then we'll stroll in the park, not a care in the world, under the blazing sun. But 40 turned into 80, into 150. The year almost over, but still we're in separate cages. Our daily routine reduced into three letters, LED or LCD. And if all else fails, we turn to SMS. Yes, we crave for each other's touch, arm on shoulder, embrace, 
Our only consolation is knowing we're still here. While things may take a turn for the worse, and seeing each other shifts farther into future, I'll leave my hopes to tomorrow, never ending as it is, for we both understand that this thing we share relies not on how our cocks graze each other, tested by the plague of society or the virus. Our unwritten pact persists. No matter how long this takes, we shall meet and return to our favorite rendezvous. Thank you. Thank you, Stan, for that uh, lovely poem. And I'd like to ask what queer book would you recommend? Okay, so right here I have the book of my friend, Wing of the Locust by Joel Donato Ching Jacob. It's a YA novel set in pre-colonial Philippines and it won the Asian Book Award. So there. Nice. So that's Wings of the Locust by yeah. Joel uh, Dunat. King Hakob. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Steno. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to our next uh, poet. Fajar Zakri is a writer based in Jakarta, Indonesia. His poems are essentially pop songs and have, have appeared on Queer Southeast Asia, Globe Trotter, and Magdalene, among others. So here's Fajar. Good um, afternoon, I think. Selamat siang. Thank you for having me. And um, the poem I'm about to read is um, about people and events from a lifetime or two ago. And fittingly, it's called 2019. Might as well have been a lifetime ago. I remember falling asleep by his side, quite signed softly in the background, fresh off a mental joy ride, then kept up by work all night. How glad I was that we didn't fuck. Then the awkward goodbye, stopped by a friend's for lunch, then went to that audition, believing I wouldn't get the part except that I did. And it was the start of a year long play without direction. Me and Inamorado gone unrecognized him, a Lothario slash the exemplary earthling. Our names high up in the unwritten marquee to each other, we were the second billing I remember not falling asleep by his side. Japanese cartoon and faint TV screen light tainted by a broken heart, then kept up by talks all night. How glad I was that we did fuck. How weird it was to bear for another. How I wish it wasn't our only time together. How I wish to have met his mother, how I wish he really had been my lover, how I never got to fully recover from a drown out love hangover, how things never quite got better, except that they did just in ways I had not anticipated. All the while I faded into the background facing the music all the while he stepped to the forefront, scheming with his tricks. A part so laughably unconvincing, might as well cue the current call and slide over to the dreamland and cry your eyes out. Tell me you love me like that one time in my dream. And cut to the next scene, looks like another false alarm, but hey, at least you loved me once. Let me repeat this line. You see, I've come this far by virtue of love. Most of it discreetly tucked, then it becomes someone else's vice. For the likes of me, we're born into this world knowing our place. The likes of me are ghost-like, but something of a human face. 
the likes of me grapple with misplaced contempt for the self. But never for one second did I regret wrapping my love up in a bow. Just to imagine how lovely it would have it would have been to tie it up to his hands. For one can love with their hands tied, the rest of the body on the go. Should it be too much to ask for though, I won't mind notching myself to his bed post, sinking into yet another bed of memory, sleeping alone. I'll do it solemnly in remembrance of everything. The pull of his blanket, the static beat of the air con, the TV that's never quite watched, just stared at, the computer screen that's somehow always on, the merging of two bodies heated by pent up lust, the trembling of my untouched bones, his delicious torso, his far-flung moans, his accidental farts and slow-burning snores, his 9 a.m. alarm call, which was never false, always ringing in my ears. His words said and unsaid, this time last year, a little over six months prior to that, a lifetime or two ago, who knows. Come catch the ghost of me roaming around his room, wrecking his sheet, picking up whatever's left of my love, the rest of me somewhere else, fully whole. Thank you. Wow, that was very moving. Uh, so thank you, Bachar. And uh, we're curious, like what book by a queer Southeast Asian writer would you recommend? So I have in my hand this book by Cyril Wong. Um, he's from Singapore, I believe. I bought this um, about two months ago and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the title first. It's called Like a Seed with its Singular Purpose. It's, it's wordy the way I like it. So I highly recommend this. It's very touching. It's thought provoking. It's emotional. It's everything you want in a poetry book. So. Great. Yeah, that's Cyril Wong's uh, Like a Seed with a Singular Purpose. Thank you so much, Fajar. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Yowald Cern Buell. Um, he's an instructor in English at the Visaya State University, Tolosa. He obtained both his bachelor's degree and master's from the University of the Philippines and is now pursuing a doctorate in communication at the UP Open University. So take it away, Ewald. Um, it's a pleasure to read my poem with everyone here today. It's a pleasure to be part of this um, anthology, the, the event um, spearheaded by the organizers and for my poem, it's basically just, I took inspiration from the fact that, um, you know, we're apart, but love doesn't have to depart. <laughs> we, we call it, we may call it virtual love affair. So this is, you know, I had a relationship when I was writing this poem. So um, I, I was yearning because of the lockdown. I was quarantined for, I believe, 15 or so days so you know the longing to be with the person you love just make you it made me write the poem anyway here's penicillin for quarantine these acrid pills i take three times a day this foul mouth cup of urinary distilled a spoonful of germination of shitty as this me i'm fed up i'm locked up all rottenly still. You barred from screwing, I leak out in thirst. Swiping for gay, swiping gay for pay pals and only fans first. Camp to come scrummy, all filtered with fans. 
your cocksure and cooey sick in my lungs. And send the bootless virals and selfies and follow altar, then undermine trolls. Thy milt is my vax, log in, virtualize your web. Distantly and masking, I'm gonna fuss you well. If no more load for sexting, I'm ready to ditch. Nothing but a residuum of our year long itch. Thank you so much. That's my poem. <laughs> Penicillin for quarantine. Thank you. It suddenly just got steamy. Um, <laughs> So I, I appreciate that you were able to explore, you know, the, the dimension of lust during the pandemic, uh, yeah. which I'm sure like some or many of us like felt. So uh, what book uh, by a queer Southeast Asian writer would you recommend? Oh, that's a very good question, Rodrigo. I would highly recommend Honorio Bartolome de Dios, Salabas ng Parlor. This book just... You know, I, I love it. I had a copy. I don't have a copy right now. I'm actually far from my hometown. Um, I'm in the institution where I'm teaching right now in the dormitories. I don't have the copy to show, but um, it's a very good book, especially for the new gener newer generation who may not have a direct, you know, first-hand experience, of course, uh, may not even have a you know, a recollection of how gay lives were back in the 90s, 80s. So it's a really good book. Um, it's in Filipino, so I hope, you know, there's a translation soon, perhaps. And um, so this book really made me, really made me proud of the gay experience in the Philippines that, you know, it, it breaks stereotypes that you know, gay are gay people are parloristas or beauticians, something like that. And it's more of like what happens, what are the the lived experiences of these people outside the parlor? And I just, I you know, I love the book. I want to reread it. I'm probably gonna buy a new one. And so that's the book I highly recommend. <laughs> yes, that's uh, Honorio Bartolome de Dioses, um, Salapas ng Parlor. Thank you, Oyewald. You're welcome. Uh, our next reader um, is Andrew Kirkrose, who's a queer, transgender, Singaporean poet and student of linguistics and literature. His work has appeared in journals, including Cordite, Poetry Review, and Perverse, and anthologies, including Exhale, an anthology of queer Singapore vo voices. So Andrew, I think we'll have um, his video off um, um, as, he, at, as it is his request. Okay, so go ahead, Andrew. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Thank you. So my poem is entitled Doom Scrollers Duplex, an Odyssey with no Nostos. This homecoming by any other name is stalled at the border of doorway and door. At the threshold, a doorway endures what must be allowed. A siren is singing as sirens must nowadays sing out loud, with no teeth left showing through three-layered cloth. Three layers of skin, and not one left, marking the point past which blood should not flow. Blood does not flow beyond taped lines on floors. It wells in the creases, air pockets, and folds. Every day a fresh crisis as pockets unfold, as things barely buried are shuddering still. Before I am buried, I shudder, stay still. No one at home knows how to weave shrouds. I dispose of my shroud before I come home, loop loose-ended meetings to tassels untorn. I suture lost endings, turn tatters to seams. I look into waters where nothing can breathe. No one remembers in waters that breathe Though bees wash up, humming of happier shores. Wash up, buzzing through a litany faster than overturn undertow, bottle intact. Then overturn undertow, unbottle the facts. Butterflies dreaming of something they knew. I daydream in butterfly, knowing no end. Scar tissue clings onto branches, no ends. 
a root of scar tissue cleaves into soil in the end, splits itself, laughing in two. Soil in the end is the basis of harbor, displaces potential, holds space for dock. This place holds potential for space, dock's soft corner from starlight, uncompasses land. Soft corner of midnight, encompassing lands between crater and pit, diffusion begins. Between crater and pit, confusion begins. Light surges through a body with no breakers, brokers no light in a body unbroken. Recover your losses at membranes uncrossed. Recovery fails when a membrane is crossed. Give the sirens whatever they want. All you want is some siren voice singing this homecoming by any other name. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I'm really drawn to the musicality of, you know, your poem. And you were able to really, I think, maximize the cascading um, form that is the duplex. Um, so Andrew, I'd like to ask, like, what book by a queer Southeast Asian writer do you recommend? Thank you so much, Rodrigo. I'd really like to recommend Gaze Back by Marilyn Tan. I believe the author describes it as a lesbian grimoire. So it's about the queer, monstrous, feminine, and the occult. It's poetry. Yes, so that's um, Gaze Back by Marilyn Tan. Thank you so much, which I think also won the Singapore Literature Award, if I'm not mistaken. The Singapore Literature Prize 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next reader um, is Miguel Bar Barreto Garcia, who was raised in the Philippines and is in their final um, PhD year in decision neuroscience, studying human perception. They perform and compete in poetry slams around Switzerland. Their poems have been accepted and published in Rattle, the Quarterly Literary Review, Singapore, Asian Cha, Harana, among others. So here's Miguel. The theme for tonight is anathema. The anthem in your chest is them. Them who had gripped your wrist behind your back. Them who grabbed your collar. It was, turns out, warm, spit. It was all play, all games, they say, harmless. But when you walk, you walk on all fours, the Pavlovian impulse to drool, to obey, obey, they say. Wag your phantom tail, and if you don't have one, they will improvise. Remember how they grab your wrist behind your back? There is a rope, and there is a knot. The knot is nylon. The knot is also gut. And on your lift to the tree, you get to be Aldrin or Armstrong in your momentary lift off. That permanent spacesuit you wear in the aftermath of memory. It is just too hard to breathe when air has the viscosity of spit. The song you play in your ear is a hum, a lullaby, inaudible to them, but you, them. What did they know about you? Just because of a no. And you say it again, no. And quietly, no. Please, that hurts. You hear yourself speak. You hear yourself 
trail into an echo. The cave is hollow and quiet enough to play with shadow and light. There is a candle in the cave. Clean the wax and make a wish. Thank you, Miguel, for that wonderful reading. And um, I also noticed the lovely art in the background. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us who the artist is? Um, these are mostly, well, these are actually just posters. Like, we're just like, oh, okay. um, but yeah. That's great. And um, what book would you recommend by a queer South Asian writer? Yeah, so I would like to recommend um, Lawrence E. Peel's um, Experiment of the Tropics. Um, reason why I particularly love this book is because it intersects history, um, Cebu, where I'm originally from, and at the same time having a queer lens of looking at both of those things, so which is like a wonderful journey of exploring back history and at the same time reminiscing Cebu as well. Yes, uh, so that's uh, Lawrence Eagle's Experiment um, of the Tropics, which yeah. also won the Gaudi Boy um, Prize um, a few years ago. Thank you, Miguel. And now we'll be moving to our last reader, um, who is a poet, uh, one of the poets um, I most admire. His name is Mark Anthony Kayanan, and he obtained an MFA from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and is a PhD candidate at the University of Adelaide, an animal counterfeit Scurrilous. Their third poetry book is forthcoming from Giramondo in 2021. And new work appears in The Margins, Electric Literature's The Commuter, and Lana Turner. They teach at the Ateneo de Manila University. So here's Mark. Thank you, Igor, for bringing us all together. Um, it's been a wonderful reading so far, actually, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, well, just a few things about the poem. Um, like, first, sorry that it's super, super long-winded. Um, I think much of the poem is kind of devoted to um, historical events that took place in the Philippines back in 1993, but then I was writing the poem, which is part of a sequence, um, last year while like the entire world was in lockdown. So, like through the mysterious process of association that so like often happens in poetry, the COVID crisis kind of like found its way into the poem and stayed there. Um, I think one other thing I can say about the poem is that it kind of enacts how obsessed I am with um, pronouns in the case of the poem. Um, it's pretty much um, me trying to test how to use the plural first person pronoun, the we pronoun. I mean, like shared individuals, um, subcollectives who, by virtue of shared suffering or shared interest, kind of weave in and out of being with one another. Yeah, so that's, I guess, enough for the poem. I'm going to be plunging into it. Occluded world. Dear each other, the miracle that should have transpired, transpired in our telling. We threw stones over our shoulders, needed to maim our shepherdless selves. We were excuses, tempting us to covet our neighbor's goods, for those are better days. Truth a thing, spreading mouth to mouth. Our freedoms haven't released us from loneliness measured by who we're with as we make do with reaching down our decencies. For honesty, trust anyone with a mask. There are deniable beliefs. And we almost trust the city priest and his aversion to bombast admitted in his homily how he preferred the unfussiness of Western apparitions, their prophets, unassuming white schoolgirls. The smart ones know when to sacrifice privacy for Our Lady's warnings and reward. No lesson here but a safe admission of guilt. 
like all our other faces, only valuable after it's recognized by another. Here, have the word. I've already stolen yours. Don't kill yourself with worry. Through a rhetoric of cocked force, the government devises us. No cure for these sleep-free nights, unrescuable hours when hunger overrides dignity. Once we're ended, our sufferings shall be our passports, is a guarantee we depend on. Parley our ignoble appetites into salvation. Appetites are all we who aren't enough are. Though some deaths are a relief, this one isn't. Our bodies are adventures we resent. Whenever hurt, we resent each other better. God never assured us we'd have it easy. To us, unquiet, except during tragedies, we hope he hasn't built a parable around us. Our prophet, with the charisma of an unmartyred saint, performed the new feeling. We curious ourselves into fervor, meant yours, when we said yes and relented. We, the setting for the prophet's visions. The prophet was teenaged savior to another's herald from a decade earlier, favored the wilderness over adulation and died of cancer. While the same virgin appeared to both. To be more useful, one must harvest attention. The prophet's face is the virgin's face, body in a bandaged dress. Years later, the secret to fucking people over, we heard a dying man say, but never caught the sentence. Deeply involved with each of our dying, the stories revived in each of our children. Our astonishments faked. Dying assembles you, your faces. A poet answered the man, but these aren't faces you'd care to remember. When we finally listened, it's no secret. No one is truly moved by the existence of others, not even you. Always, this perceptible discrepancy we mistake for envy. Pity is it affection. Did the prophet whom we used to love trick us? Whose denials must we disbelieve to be convinced we were either stupid or stupid together. We in our younger eyes were a sea of hair on the mountain, our hungers transparent. That time we worshipped was when some of us lived best. Now we test tiny deaths every day. Our one fate traced back to a man, blonde beautiful, known for vigor. He flew country to country to pass on the edgeless fear of ourselves. Pathogens, like doomsday prophecies, can drive us to faith or premature annihilation. In any story, the telling's the one predictable end. We don't throw wisdoms, throw tiny shocks of anger the way we throw compliments. We're important, having had more mass cards and owning all sad stories. We carry bitternesses and haggle at the market. By we, we mean every I has disclaimers. If we adore you, how much do you owe us? We swim past the crowd of we and flail against the tightening net. During the final apparition, we expected a show to outshine souls. Suns shooting all its flares inside us, wanted maybe God and all thinkable gains, but then distracted clouds, unpregnant disappointment, how God's gentle reprimands have death souls. If the prophet loved, they spread love with the fairness of the indifferent. Though we crave an earthly justice, we have dogs, we need mercy. A swordless angel 
golden robed, one team cutting across our bodies. No angel is decrepit and undue punishment. Every decrepit government land, we've tried and tried to restore ourselves, flung prayers to the world in regular despair. Though the world mimics the evil in us, each other we shoulder and hollow, hollow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And I really love the multi-layered nature of your poem. And even when the dog, that your dogs like started barking. Five dogs. Um, it felt organic, yes. organic to the poem, you know, like all of these, I guess, noise and um, yeah, the, the job. Um, so what, what book by a queer Southeast Asian writer do you recommend? Um, all right, so I'm holding here, it's actually one of my favorite books ever written by a Filipino, Ang Nawawala, Sakberi Pascual. It's, um, yeah, it's in Filipino. I'm not sure if a translation exists. I mean, if I had the time and the talent, I actually would try to translate it. It's, it's a novel, I think, with um, stories that are interconnected. Um, like, all the stories take place in one barangay, and... Um, the stories feature like one protagonist, this like super intrepid queer receptionist named Brie, who kind of doubles as like the like the community sleuth, the community investigator. So she's like a third world Nancy Drew, pretty much. And like I love the book because the stories are extremely funny, they're campy, but then also at the same time, like the stories are so like deeply immersed in the life of the community that um, I think it's especially a wonderful novel to read at a time when, like, everyone is forced into isolation and, like, the feathers that normally bind people together, like, I think are kind of obstructed at the moment, right? Like, this feels like the kind of novel that exists precisely because those feathers exist. It's really wonderful. Great. So that's Chuck Berry Pascual's Ang Nawawala. Which, like, the missing for those who, yeah. Um, yeah, want the translation. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I post this question to everyone. If you want to answer, you know, just turn on a video. And I want to ask, uh, how has your writing changed during the pandemic? And I'm curious to know, you know, how your way of looking at the world and thinking about the world has altered and how this shift has translated into your writing. So um, does anyone want to answer? I will, if it's okay. Yeah. Oh, am I on? No. Yep, yep, you're on. Yeah, I would say I write more these days actually and I write in my native language in Bahasa Indonesia, which I never did before, believe it or not. Um, and I think my writing has become even more angry and, and political. And I think because the past year has just been um, a series of realizations in a sense that what we call normal was never normal, you know? So I think um, my poetry now is more about reimagining or rather imagining a new world, a new normal, um, a, a better normal for people, for all of us. So that's how our writing has changed. Okay, and anyone else wants to answer that question, how your writing has changed during the pandemic? Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, and it channels Rilke, um, and that is, what advice would you give to a young Southeast Asian poet who is queer? You know, um, like, do you have any advice? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, the more senior poets um, in the group, maybe Mark or Nerisa can answer this question. Rodrigo. 
Oh, go ahead, Deb. Can I answer your first question? I'm so yes, sorry. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> go ahead, Deb. For yes. me, um, as a writer, you really, you really need time, right, to make sure that you get to, you know, your creative juices are maximized. Um, so this pandemic really ready to reflect and look back and just, you know, think of the nuances that our community, different, perhaps across the globe, are experiencing. And it made me also active in, in, in virtual spaces like this one um, and collaborate despite the distance, despite being apart. So it, it somehow enabled me to, you know, get into a different persona because you get to talk more of people that you don't normally get to talk with when it's, you know, it's normal because we have all our, you know, our time for work, something like that. So I think for me, it's more of getting different voices uh, from the people, from different communities, from the webinars, you know, LGBT organized um, events like this one. So um, yeah, that's that's how my writing has changed. It has become um, different voices have somehow, <laughs> you know, sunk into the pages of my notebooks. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's good. It's good to know that, you know, somehow um, you've been, I guess, productive and you've learned to, I guess, internalize, um, like, all those different voices. Um, but, yeah, I guess our, our closing question would be, like, what advice would you give to a young Southeast Asian poet who is queer? And I think uh, Nerissa uh, is going to give an answer. Um, so I've, I've existed on this earth for 47 years and throughout those 47 years, since I was six years old, I had wanted to be an artist, but then not only an artist, I also wanted to be myself, but then in those 47 years, I was rendered first invisible and I learned to practice invisibility or self erasure and although I'm claiming what Rodrigo is labeling me as a senior writer I think I'm as young as the next one when I say to myself because I'm learning and being the same way as everyone else, that to exist is to resist. It doesn't even have to be an outward gesture. It's an inward being or just being. Just be and create in this world. And I am so grateful for this younger generation fighting for this kind of visibility that I am also enjoying now. And I want to, to say that right now. Thank you for that. So exist. Thank you for that uh, great advice, Nerissa, you know, to just be and create and, you know, to do what you love. Um, do you have another answer? Um, anyone can, yeah. I'd like to share <laughs> another, um, an answer to your question. It, um, I, I really like the, the way um, Nerissa mentioned about um, existence as resistance. Right. Um, when we write, especially the new, write, the new, the emerging writers right now, the LGBT community, they have to write based on their lived experiences because, again, part of being a writer is to represent, and representation is really important in literature. I, since I'm teaching, I make sure that I have literary pieces from LGBTQ um, I plus writers because. If you don't, then it wouldn't 
translate to action. It wouldn't translate the change of mindset, of um, policies, for example. And so for me, I, I, I'm so blessed that I'm, I was born, you know, I was born in an, a period where there was still no, um, no, the, the kind of technologies before that, the, the kind of technologies we have right now were not yet when I was born. So there was like letter writing. So we were able to play outside. So I now I, I'm, I'm so blessed and thankful that I was able to see how the, the leave experiences of LGBT community has progressed. And um, for the aspiring writers, just really write what you're experiencing because that's the best, that's the best contribution that you can give for our, for our literature our literary tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Eolf. Um, and we've reached the end of our program. And before we close, I'd like to thank the ASEAN Soggy Caucus for giving us this platform that really enriches the discourse of queer literature in Southeast Asia. We also thank Voice for their support as well as the festival team, including Ryan, Ivanka, and AR for all their help and patience. We especially thank our interpreters who are with us today, John, Jojo, Mariah, and Raymond. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the poets in the anthology, especially those who read their poems today. Thank you for giving voice to our queer experiences during the pandemic. Thank you to our viewers um, and please continue to support the other programs of the Southeast Asia Queer Cultural Festival. And once again, my name is Rodrigo and we wish all of you a good day. Maraming salamat.